You're listening to Southern Fried Sports with Travis Ryer on Tide 100.9 in Tuscaloosa. This is Southern Fried Sports with Bama Online Senior Analyst Travis Ryer on your home for Alabama sports. Tide 100.9 and streaming on the Tide 100.9 app. University of Alabama Athletics, Tide 100.9 FM. Travis Schreier, Senior Analyst for BamaOnline.com, part of the 247sports.com network. Your daily host here on the program from 11 a.m. until noon. We like to have a lot of fun on the program. I mean, we're going to talk a lot of sports. That's what we do here. But we're not afraid to get into some food, maybe some entertainment, Before you ask, no, I didn't watch much of the Grammys last night. I was very happy to see the late John Prine. Glad to see John Prine, the great John Prine, get his due uh, from the Grammys, uh, even though the CMAs uh, apparently couldn't muster up the same type of respect. But I was happy to see that. Otherwise, this isn't your program on a Monday for the Grammys. But we got a lot to get into the show, as always, brought to you by Peterbrook Chocolates here out there at 1530 McFarland Boulevard, north of the Indian Hills section of Tuscaloosa. The Chocolate Lady, you wondering who's got the gold? Who's got the gold with St. Patrick's Day coming up here in the next 48 hours? The Chocolate Lady's got the gold. Got those gold chocolate coins out there at Peterbrook Chocolates here. Let the end of your rainbow be. Peterbrook Chocolates here, 1530 McFarland Boulevard. North. Joined on the program by executive producer Jacob Harrison, who together we combine a form the 60 Woo! of Sports Talk Radio. And I know, among other things, Jacob Harrison, he's fired up. The Alabama men's basketball team pulls the twofer, wins the regular season title, and then wins the TV show to boot. Of course, the TV show, also known as the SEC Men's Basketball Tournament. Alabama men's basketball, a two seed heading up to the Indianapolis area for the 2021 NCAA men's basketball tournament. The toughest, the most difficult championship to win, especially from the team perspective in all of collegiate sports. That quest gets underway Saturday afternoon up in Indianapolis. I know Jacob Harrison's happy about that, but if you really want to get Jacob Harrison excited, although I'm not sure how much of a participant his team's going to be, he's got NFL free agency coming up too. You excited, aren't you, Jacob? I, I, yeah. Uh, well, I, I'll, I'll start with the positive <laughs> is that I, I, you know, after years of being ignorant to, to what college basketball is, I now understand why it is so enjoyable. The, those those two games over the weekend were just absolutely amazing. amazing. Uh, but yeah, my Steelers, uh, it's pretty much uh, pretty much confirmed Juju Smith Schuster is not going to be back. So that means losing Bud Dupree. And Juju Smith Schuster, I am. I, I need to go find a happy place. Yeah, that's that's rough on the hardcore Steeler fans. I love some Juju uh, Dupree. Of course, he had the tough injury, didn't he, during the season? Yeah, uh, that ACL. was rough. Yeah, that was rough on that defense. But uh, a lot of changes coming up in the NFL, and we'll get into some of those as we move throughout the week. But primarily today. College sports, the focus. A little pro golf on the cable for you, too. Speaking of Alabama ties, we'll get into some of Justin Thomas. How about those closing 11 holes for JT at the Players' Championship down in Ponte Vedra? You know how they say Mountain Brock over in the Birmingham area? Well, down in the Jacksonville area, it's Ponte Vedra. And JT, 
How about JT with a little check yesterday for $2.7 million? Yeah, that'll work. That'll work for a week down there on the northeast Atlantic coast, uh, northeast coast of Florida. Yeah, you'll take that. I'd take the caddy cut. I mean, if the caddy cut is the standard 10%, his caddy, Jim Johnson, he's looking at 270 k for looping for the week. I'd take the 270 you know, just the 10% would be fine. Uh, but a lot of college basketball talk as we prepare you for the big dance coming up in the next few days. You are also, by the way, if you're an Alabama fan, you're going to have your eyes on ESPN this evening because the women's team at Alabama expected to snap a 22-year drought where the NCAA women's basketball tournament is concerned. First time since 1999. First time since 1999. First time this century. In other words, Alabama women's basketball expected to have its name called when that selection show gets underway tonight at 6 p.m. on ESPN. So a lot of hoops talk. We also, though, have some important college football recruiting news to get into from over the weekend. We sort of previewed this for you late last week. Emmanuel Henderson, the five-star running back from Hartford, Alabama. You ever been to Hartford, Alabama, Jacob? You're from down that way, kind of. That's a little bit west, excuse me, east of where you're from. But Hartford, Alabama, it's just above the Florida line down there. No, I don't I don't think I've made it out uh, <laughs> that, that far. I've been all over the state, though, so that would be a first to, to find a place not to have been. I've been to Hartford, Connecticut, and also Hartford, Alabama. Just a little bit of a difference, you know, just a little just a, a smidge, uh, but Emmanuel Henderson, the five-star running back uh, from down that way, Geneva County High School on Saturday afternoon, announced his commitment to the Alabama Crimson Tide. Hank South, my colleague there at BamaOnline.com coming up. We're going to get into that with Hank, among other recruiting items. We'll have that covered for you at the bottom of the hour, but until then, 205 342 Nine nine zero four. That is the Peterbrook Chocolatier Studio Line. We have winners and losers on Mondays, man. And again, when you're looking at Alabama athletics, it's just winners and winners on this Monday, isn't it? Alabama football gets a W with Emmanuel Henderson. Alabama basketball. In my lifetime, it's the greatest stretch of twenty three basketball games I've ever seen from the University of Alabama. I feel safe in saying that. And I know there's been some really good teams in my lifetime. Go back to C.M. Newton before Wimp kind of set the stage for all that. Uh, Mark Godfrey had a 2002 regular season SEC title, took Alabama to the Elite Eight two years later, including an upset of top seed in the West region, Stanford, to help make that run. But I'm talking about over 23 games. Alabama on Pops' birthday. Pops' birthday is December the 19th. So when Pops turned 73, this Alabama basketball team was 4-3. and three. 23 games later, nearly three months to the day later, Alabama sits at 24-6. and 20-3. And, and again, that's all Power 5, all 23 of those games. Power 5 competition, whether it was SEC play, Uh, whether we're talking about the non-con loss to Oklahoma, just an incredible run, Uh, a once-in-a-lifetime type of run here, for me anyway. And so we'll see if they can carry that over. We know for all the great accomplishments, and for me anyway, if the season ended with an upset loss to Iona, it's still a, a season for all time. To win the regular season the way Alabama did and then to cap it with a tournament championship win, it's already a season for all time. Now, sure, you know, it, the, the beer would turn drastically warm uh, kind of looking at this season in total with an upset loss at the hands of Rick Patino of all people, and the Gales of Iona coming up on Saturday afternoon. I don't see that happening. Now, there's certainly precedent for twos beating 15s, but as Jay Billis of ESPN tweeted this morning, 15 seeds are – uh, eight and 132 when it comes to knocking off two seeds in the NCAA tournament. So I think Alabama is going to be fine. I think they're going to be fine up there at Hinkle Fieldhouse. That's another bonus in all of this. You saw the movie Hoosiers, right? Of course you saw the movie Hoosiers. The home gym for Butler featured in that film 
when Hickory gets to the state championship game to take on the South Bend squad. Was that South Bend Central, I guess, something like that? Uh, that's filmed right there at Hinkle. And so you're going to have throwback, throwback venue on top of everything else for this Alabama team as it takes on Iona on Saturday afternoon. That's a 3 p.m. tip central on TBS. And then you look at the bracket. I thought the bracket shook out pretty well for Alabama. I didn't really have any complaints. You know, I think some fans think, well, we should get Iona five times until the Monday night of the national championship game. And then you can give us somebody like, I don't know, Baylor or Gonzaga in the championship game. doesn't work that way. And that's why, again, toughest team championship in all of collegiate sports to win is the men's basketball championship. Because even if you take the first round game out, you take a team like Alabama as a two and you say, well, that's a 15. You know, that's a game Alabama's going to be favored 15-plus, you got to think, coming up on Saturday. Okay, take that game out. You still got five more from that point forward. And once you get to the second round and you start thinking about UConn or Maryland, those are two very capable teams that are very much capable of taking you out before the 16. Then you get to the 16. A really, really good Texas team is very much a possibility for the 16. And then up top, you're looking at what, Michigan? Michigan dealing with a major injury. I had no problem. I think if you're an Alabama fan, you liked Alabama being the two with Michigan. I think that was the weakest of the ones. They're also dealing with a major injury to Isaiah Livers. He's got a stress fracture and a foot. So you think about the big picture of the bracket, and I like it for Alabama. I think Texas, I'm going to go ahead and go on record here. First thing, hot take central, right? First thing on a Monday, I'm going to come straight out of the box and say the the obstacle in the way of Alabama reaching the Final Four will be Texas in the 16. I think if Alabama can get by Texas in the 16, regardless of who it gets, whether it's Michigan, Florida State, in the 8, I think the Crimson Tide in good shape if they can just get to the 8 and get through Texas. I think also in this bracket – you know, you've got the potential for some uh, some good stuff up top. You know, when you talk about that second round matchup, potentially of Michigan and LSU, given the way LSU performed in Nashville, do you really want to see that team right now? I mean, if that big three of Smart and Wadford and Thomas are going to play the way they played against Alabama yesterday, Alabama had absolutely no answers for Trendon Wadford. And they tried everybody. Give Nate Oates and that staff credit. They threw everybody they had at Trendon Wofford. Now, it worked out on the final possession. You had the best defensive player in the country on Trendon Wofford, as it should have been in that situation. Two of the very best players in the SEC and probably all of college basketball. That's the way SEC play should have ended for 2021. Those two guys in the middle of the floor, and let's see what happens. But I think LSU, if it gets Michigan in the second round, that one could be a lot of fun. 205-342-9904. We're going to step aside for our first break. When we come back, winners and losers on a Monday. Hey, Alabama baseball, Alabama softball, definitely a part of that mix. Justin Thomas, big winner down at the Players in Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida. Back with more of the show right after this. The biggest. Mostly cloudy, showers and thunderstorms are likely through tonight. The high today, 76. The low tonight, 66. Tomorrow, occasional showers. The high, 77. Wednesday, rain and thunderstorms likely. Storms Wednesday afternoon could be severe. The high, 78. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 70 degrees in Tuscaloosa. Tide 100.9. For more coverage of Alabama football, visit us at Tide100.9.com or download the free Tide 100.9 app. The Crimson Tide. Will not be denied. Look out of any window. 
on this day in 1940, Grateful Dead bassist and very occasional vocalist, Phil Esch. Phil dropping those uh, Phil bombs on the bass back in the day for the Grateful Dead. Phil doesn't tour with the latest edition of The Dead, as it's called. You got John Mayer. You probably saw John Mayer on the Grammys last night, didn't you? Marin Morris. John Mayer now in that role of Jerry Garcia. Still got Bill we- uh, Bob Weir there leading up uh, the vocals and some guitar. and Bill Critchman, Mickey Hart on the dual drums. But Phil has kind of uh, decided it's it's a wrap with the dead at this point. Saw the dead a couple of summers ago. It seems 10 years ago now with the COVID. But John Mayer and Weir and the rest of those guys at uh, Folsom Field in Boulder, Colorado a couple summers ago. Took the youngest daughter out there. Eye-opening experience. The festival that is known as a dead show. No doubt about that. 205 342 9904 is the Peterbrook Chocolatier Studio Line. If you'd like to jump on board with us on a Monday morning, we would love to hear from you. Some of the blue bloods in college basketball, they're not messing around, man. Even with the COVID situation and all that, you're seeing some uh, some blood, blood in the streets where the coaching business is concerned already on this Monday. Indiana, according to Jeff Goodman of Stadium.com, Indiana has made the move to fire Archie Miller. Now, Archie Miller, according to Goodman, has a $10 million buyout. I didn't know Jimmy Sexton represented basketball coaches, too. That's some Jimmy Sexton-ish, isn't it? $10 million buyout? Well, it is Indiana. So Indiana, once again, in sort of the the basketball equivalent of the post-Gene Stallings Alabama abyss, where football was concerned back in those days, still in search of the right coach. Kelvin Sampson's been through there. Now of Houston. Interestingly enough, Kelvin Sampson's taken his Houston team up to the NCAA tournament, and the Cougars' first round game is right there in Bloomington at IU. Uh, you've also had Tom Crean in there at IU, hasn't worked out. Coach Dwayne Wade at Marquette previously. Of course, Crean now the head coach at the University of Georgia. And so Archie Miller, there was kind of a pool about which of the Miller brothers might go first in this coaching cycle. Would it be Archie at Indiana? Would it be Sean Miller at Arizona with the NCAA vultures seemingly soaring above that program out in Tucson? Well, it's Archie. Archie going away with 10 mil, though. Good for him. 205-342-9904. That is the Peterbrook Chocolatier Studio Line. We told you a pretty good weekend on the Diamonds for Alabama, too. Alabama baseball. What did we tell you last week about that series with Stetson? What did we tell you? We told you it was going to be ultra competitive. Stetson's traditionally a really, really solid mid-major type program. Always has pitching. Stetson is kind of like the group of five version of Vanderbilt. Stetson is always going to have pitching. And for a couple games, Alabama got pitched up pretty good. But they pull out the rubber contest Alabama does yesterday. And so now it's time to kind of like breaking spring training at this point. Because uh, getting into SEC play, that's the big leagues, as we know. And why not just make a trip to number one Arkansas? this weekend to get it going for Brad Bohannon and the guys. That's how Alabama baseball will open SEC play this weekend at number one, Arkansas. One of the, one of the polls, it may be, it may be baseball America. One of the polls I saw this morning, uh, one through five in the top 25 teams in the country, all SEC teams, all SEC teams. So, uh, you know, Alabama, even I think in dropping that, Friday game, still moved up a couple of spots. So there is respect around college baseball for winning two out of three against a really good Stetson team, really solid Stetson team. Brad Bohannon, no doubt, scheduled this way. Uh, when you think about 
the, the, the ramp up to SEC play. Stetson's the best team Alabama's faced to this point. And you see them right before you take off to Arkansas. Now you do have, you do have a midweek game this week at Troy on Tuesday before you go to Fayetteville. So that's where it sits for Alabama baseball this week. Alabama softball 22 and one now after that sweep of the Auburn Tigers over the weekend. Look like Auburn was watching that game yesterday. Look like Auburn with a two nothing lead there about the midway point of that game. Look like they were going to save a game of that series. But you know what? Bailey Dowling, the freshman infielder, said, nah, you know, this broom feels pretty good. And she used a broom to hit a three-run shot to the top of the scoreboard down there at Auburn in the left center. And with that, Alabama goes on to win 4-2 to two yesterday and complete the three-game sweep. Montana Fouts, really good in relief. I believe Kilfoyle got two of the wins down there, but – Fouts was really good on Saturday in her start, and then she came in in the bottom of the fifth yesterday. Kilfoyle was pretty good, not quite on top of it. She gave up a lot of hits on Friday, but she struck out 10 to sort of work around that one. But Fouts shut it down pretty good there in the final three innings. So Patrick Murphy, 22-1, and softball at UAB on Wednesday this week, and then you got the Vols of Tennessee in here for three over the weekend. Yeah, you know, when you think about those games in Nashville from Saturday and Sunday, definitely had an NCAA tournament feel to them, right? I mean, even though, as we've talked about before, the tournament is essentially a television show, it's content. You know, that's what the, the, the cable providers, that's what the networks pay for. They, they want that content, and they got their money's worth. I mean, ESPN, once again, Gets every bit of its money's worth with this SEC tournament, especially where the semifinals and the final were concerned. Now, Saturday was a real gut check for Alabama in the Tennessee win. You know, that one had the feel with about five minutes left that you, know, you wondered if Alabama was going to be able to close that game out. But again, you were encouraged that on a day when it didn't shoot the three particularly well, it was able to win a basketball game in some other ways. And so defensively, you continue to be con- – uh, encouraged by this team and then just the fortitude just the makeup of these cats man you know herb jones when you think about what it takes to win an ncaa tournament title he is you got to have a herb jones in my opinion just a guy that y- y- you gotta y- you gotta kill him dead and it's not always pretty and it wasn't pretty again yesterday for herb six of 16 from the field but he does have 11 rebounds. That was such a Herb line yesterday. 13 points, 11 rebounds, 6 assists, and 4 blocks. I mean, that sums up That sums up Herb Jones. And the 6 of 16 from the field sums him up, too. But, again, the bench comes through big for Alabama. Quinterly, great again, deserving of MVP honors. Uh, you know, Reese made a couple of threes for you. Bruner's just playing on guts at this point. He's obviously not right with those knees. Uh, That was very evident, more so in terms of what he was trying to do defensively out on the floor. He just just couldn't guard those LSU guys out there on the floor. But, you know, Bruner gives you 13 minutes. But so many of these complimentary players who have absolutely bought into their roles, like Jawan, Gary, eight points, Eight rebounds, seven of those off the offensive glass in 17 minutes of work. If you're big on plus-minus, plus-minus stat in basketball is kind of the – it measures your team's point performance while you're on the floor. In other words, in the time you're on the floor, how much did your team lead or trail? And for Alabama yesterday, its leader in plus-minus was Jawan Gary. He was plus eight. Alabama was eight, plus eight with Jawan Gary on the four, plus five with Quinterly, and plus six with Alex Reese. Keon Ellis, they were plus five. Ellis filling in there as a starter. Very efficient once again. Some of these acquisitions that Oates and this staff have made have just proven absolutely perfect. Ellis coming from the junior college ranks gives you that defender He's also showing increased confidence when it comes to 
taking big shots and big moments, hit another big three yesterday in the second half. And then you got the seniors, of course. Petty wasn't the John Petty that you'd like to see at this point in the season. But, again, you still got 59 points from three of your guards. And really, the number goes to 72 if you count Herb as a guard. A lot of perimeter play, a lot of uh, uh, good stuff, but you have to give a lot of credit to LSU, too. Um, again, Wadford, Smart in the second half was a real problem. When Javante Smart starts making threes, it's going to be really tough, and he was doing that in the second half yesterday. Uh, but Wadford, there just wasn't a matchup for him. Other than Herb, and the problem with that was, okay, you put Herb on Wadford, and you got Smart going off out here now. So how do you deal with that? Tough matchups. You got Cam Thomas that can go off. That's a really tough deal. But Alabama fights through it, gets the win 80-79, to 79, and on to the big dance as the two seed is the Crimson Tide. Going to head to a break. When we come back, Hank South of BamaOnline.com. He's going to talk some Emmanuel Henderson commitment to the Crimson Tide football program. When Southern Fried Sports returns on a Monday, the show has always brought to you by Peter Brook Chocolatier, 1530 McFarland Boulevard North. Back with more of the show right after this. You're listening to Southern Fried Sports with BamaOnline.com senior analyst Travis Ryer. On your home for Alabama sports. Tide 100.9. And streaming on the Tide 100.9 app. To all the great news for the University of Alabama Athletic Department over the weekend was the addition of five-star running back Emmanuel Henderson to the Alabama Crimson Tide football program's 2022 recruiting class. Joining us here on Southern Fried Sports Now to talk about that and a few other items of interest. Hank South does an outstanding job covering recruiting for us there at Bama Online. Dot com And, uh, Hank, a busy weekend around here, but always time. There's always time and always room for Nick Saban. Uh, we're an in-state, no less, five-star running back is concerned. And that guy was Emmanuel Henderson on Saturday. Uh, talk about what led up to this and sort of, you know, the, 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 the trend that this followed throughout his re- recruitment. Yeah, it's been about a year in the making for Emmanuel Henderson. I, I think, you know, he, he was one of that um, last group of visitors. He was part of that last group of visitors that was in Tuscaloosa way back last March, um, that, that final junior day right before everything really shut down. Um, so he was one of the last in-person visitors. That's the weekend he got his offer from Alabama. Um, and, and from there, you know, it kind of just took off in the direction for Alabama. Um, you know, I've been writing since, you know, around the Iron Bowl, I think just shortly after it really felt like, you know, the vibe you got talking to Emmanuel Henderson, kind of people around the recruitment that, you know, the tide was, was really kind of trending in the right direction for him. I, you know, they, they've always been high on his list, but, you know, you take into account that he grew up an Auburn fan. Um, you know, he's got some Auburn pull on his side of the family. Um, you know, he, he obviously was a national recruit as well. You know, schools, Michigan was coming after him, some other, um, some other big schools. Um, but, you know, it, it really started to feel like Alabama had, a pretty good shot there uh, around late fall. He had kind of said, you know, well, he, he did say, you know, he, he was leaning towards one school. He wasn't going to say it at the time, obviously, but, you know, he kind of had his mind made up back in November. So um, it, it, kinda, it was turning in the right direction. You know, Charles Huff left, the running backs coach, um, who, who he had been um, talking with. Charles Kelly was obviously his area recruiter who he had kind of the main connection with. But, um, you know, Robert Gillespie comes in. For Charles Huff, kind of a seamless transition, and, and I think it, you know it, it kind of all goes back to uh, you know just the loyalty and the relationship he had with uh, with Charles Kelly. 
Nick Saban and, and then making him a priority. You know, they made him feel like a priority throughout the whole time. That never really changed. And, you know, talking to Emmanuel Henderson's head coach, he said that was a big thing. Like I said, the, the loyalty and, you know, the, the guys that have been there with him throughout this whole process, you know, that was kind of what um, ultimately there are several factors, but ultimately sealed the deal for for Alabama on Saturday. And, yeah, just a big time pickup, second five star and just over two weeks to, to commit to Alabama. So they're picking up pretty quick. Yeah, you know, we wondered a little bit about this mass transition on the offensive side of the ball, not just in terms of on the field performance and things like that, but, you know, you go from Steve Sarkeesian with the quarterbacks and the offensive coordinator role to Bill O'Brien and pretty much immediately pick up Ty Simpson, a five-star quarterback a couple weekends ago, and and now here comes a five-star running back, as you said, with Rob Gillespie in there now as the running backs coach for Charles Huff. Uh, seamless, I think you was the word you used. And it seems to certainly apply here with the latest acquisitions. A couple of real flagship pieces uh, on the offensive side of the ball, for sure. Um, we talk about five-star running backs in the Nick Saban era. You did a great job there at Bama Online. Dot com in the aftermath of Henderson's commitment of providing an overview of those guys, Trent Richardson, TJ Yeldon, Derek Henry, Bo Scarborough, the Harrises, Damian, uh, and also Najee, Trey Sanders here more recently. And then, of course, in the 2021 cycle, Kamar Wheaton. It's kind of interesting to note that the backs have sort of been a little bit of everything. Yes, size has been a common denominator with more than a few of them, especially when you talk about sort of the first half of that list. But if we kind of continue to move forward and as the game continues to evolve, a guy like Kamar Wheaton in this most recent class, he's not a 6'2", 220 guy, is he? No, he, he's actually, he's, you know, fairly compact. You know, I think about 5'11", 190, 200. Um, but, you know, you, you turn on his tape and he just flies, you know, he, he can do all sorts of things. And what, you know, with, with Emmanuel Henderson, what makes him unique is, you know, Bama's not really actually, I mean, obviously, you know, he's, he's rated as a running back, a five-star running back, but he's, he's more recruited as an athlete when it comes to Alabama. Um, you know, I think, I think that's kind of what really sold him on, on, you know, the pitch Alabama was making, you know, they're, they're obviously loaded at running back. They've got a lot of guys in there. Um, just signed Kamar Wheaton as well. Um, but, you know, they, they told him they don't envision him as just a running back. They, they can, you know, put him in the slot. He can return kicks. He, he can do all sorts of different things. And I think he kind of liked, you know, the idea of not just being, you know, putting put that running back box. You know, he, he can he can check, he can do several different things on offense. Um, and, you know, 6'1", you know, 185 or, you know, what, I don't have a size listed right in front of me. I might be off a few pounds, but, um, you know, he's not even close. You know, we talked to Steve Wolf on, on his evaluation and, you know, he was like, I don't think he's even close to, to filling out to what, what he could be. So, you know, he, he's kind of, he's long linky right now, but, you know, we'll see kind of what happens once he gets in, into the weight program and, and all that and what he can do. But yeah, I mean, you're talking about just kind of a, an offensive tool that you can do several different things with outside of just, you know, handing the ball out of the backfield. Speaking of tools, one that can't hurt in recruiting uh, is the National Football League. And when you talk about the six five stars at the running back position in the Nick Saban era that have passed through the program, that's the one thing they all have in common. They all have played (laughs) or will play in the case of Najee Harris in the National Football League. Now, we look ahead now and you start thinking about Perhaps the recruiting process returning to another semblance of normalcy. I see an update that you had with Bobby Taylor, the cornerback from Katy, Texas, who is committed to Texas A&M right now. But I know here in the last couple of days, he's announced his intentions to make an official visit to Alabama in mid-June. Is we taking that as a sign maybe that, that things could start to to loosen back up? I mean, we are – what exactly really a year anniversary into this shutdown from a visit perspective yeah maybe it's just you know trying to will it to happen you know (laughs) we'll see but um it it seems like it's all moving in the right direction you know um the dead period the dead period is currently extended through the end of may so you know that's not going to change um but there's been a lot of buzz a lot of you know whispers that you know that there could be some sort of normalcy in terms of 
you know, maybe camps, um, perhaps visits, you know, kind of putting that recruiting calendar in, outside of a dead period into a quiet period, which allows in-person recruiting. So, um, we, yeah, we saw Bobby Taylor announce official visit plans. I don't know if that's, you know, that's when he wants to or if that's when he actually set it, uh, set it for. Um, so we'll, we'll see. But um, it was kind of an interesting update from him, just considering he just committed to Texas A&M three weeks ago. And uh, he didn't have Val Bem in his final three when he announced. I think he committed over – Texas and Michigan, so uh, perhaps Bama's making some some ground. Uh, but uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see that this uh, this summer um, when recruiting opens, if it opens back up, because you know last last spring all we talked about last spring and summer all we talked about was how this could be the biggest flip flip season of all time. All the all the guys were committing in the spring and summer because there was so much uncertainty. They were trying to get their spots, um, and then you know everyone was going to flip when visits opened back up in the fall. Well, visits never opened back up in the fall. Um, so it wasn't as dramatic of a, of a flip season as, as maybe some anticipated, um, you know, that I, I think that could be interesting with this year with, uh, you know, with visits looking like they probably will open back up at some point, guys that are already committed, you know, guys that have never, never really experienced the full recruiting process yet. You know, those guys are going to be tempted to take visits and that's, you know, for every commitment list, you know, I would imagine Bama commits currently are probably going to take visits elsewhere. Um, some of them at least, um, in, in other schools. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I saw Bobby Taylor schedule that one and then, Ty Simpson quote tweeted him and said, see you there. So maybe Ty Simpson's going as well. So we'll see kind of how this all starts to unfold. And I guess with Taylor, no surprise to see that new Alabama assistant coach, cornerbacks coach Jay Valai, given his ties to the state of Texas previously, uh, looks to be the primary recruiter for Bobby Taylor. Yeah, Jay Valai's kind of taken over. Um, you know, it kind of seems like he's, he's filled in for the, the Carl Scott areas, um, parts of Texas, um, parts of Alabama, you know, that, that kind of seems, uh, where his territory is at. Um, but yeah, you know, recruits just rave about him, you know, uh, another big name that just kind of reopened his recruitment earlier this, uh, last week, I guess was, uh, Evan Stewart, um, the, the big wide receiver out of Texas, you know, he, he's talked about how he's, his connection, um, is with Jay Valai and, you know, he's going to be a big kind of asset for, for Alabama in, in that Texas region where, where Bama's coming off losing Carl Scott and Jeff Banks, who were there too main Texas recruiters. Now they have um, Jay Valai and Jay Graham kind of manning that, that position, which, you know, I don't think there'll be much of a drop off with those two guys um, working for Alabama in, in the state of Texas. We are on the precipice of the start of 2021 spring football drills at the university of Alabama. And of course, recruiting never stops. And Hank, Tim Watts, the rest of our staff there at BamaOnline.com do a great, great job of keeping you informed on all of that but hank as you know it's basketball season man it is march madness around uh the university of alabama and this men's basketball program the women's program for that matter but before we get out of here wanted to ask you about maybe another late target or two for nate oats on the recruiting trail for this 2022 cycle is it pretty much down to a big man a post from img and maybe a a big 12 transfer that's on the market. Yeah, it was kind of funny looking at the message boards over the weekend. It was like, there was very little mention of football. It felt like outside of a few, outside of Emmanuel Henderson committing, it was all Sunday. It was all basketball on the BOL round table. But um, yeah, you know, that that's kind of where we've been at for a while. Charles Betty Ocko, uh, the, the top 50 center out of IMG Academy in Florida, obviously Canadian, um, Canada native. So, um, you know, Bama's been after him for a long time, you know, well over, you know, I guess this fall to make probably about two years they've been after him. Um, one of Nate Oates and staff's early targets once they um, came on board in Tuscaloosa. And you know, he, he's been saying a decision is probably coming in March. He said the same thing in February, said the same thing in January. So, um, you know, he, he's we'll see. We Last week, you know, it kind of seemed like there'd be a prime date for him to announce in March. It was his birthday, I think, on the 13th um, or, or sometime around then. Um, and he didn't announce, so we'll keep an eye on that. But, um, you know, you got to continue to like Bama's, you know, positive momentum in that one, especially coming off the SEC tournament title. Um, beyond Betty Ako, um, you know, Namari Burnett, the Texas Tech combo guard transfer, um, a guy that has always been high on Alabama, even out of the high school recruiting process. He said Bama finished runner up for him. Um, you know, he, he's still out there. I, I caught up with him yesterday to kind of get some reaction on the. SEC tournament title, and, and he said, uh, you know, he watched the game, was really excited, said he's probably going to try to make a decision in mid-April. So that's kind of his timeline. We'll see if Betty Yako follows through and makes a decision in March, and we can kind of 
get some potential closure on how this uh, this full signing class is going to turn out for Alabama. Well, there you go. Hank South, as always, doing a great job for us here on Southern Fried Sports. Each and every day, you're going to find Hank South there at BamaOnline.com. Hank, we appreciate the time, my friend. Of course, anytime. There he goes, Hank South. If you haven't already, give him a follow on Twitter, at Hank South. 247. Back with more of a Monday edition of Southern Fried Sports right here on Tide 100.9 FM right after this. If you want to. Mostly cloudy, showers and thunderstorms are likely through tonight. The high today 76, the low tonight 66. Tomorrow, occasional showers, the high 77. Wednesday, rain and thunderstorms likely. Storms Wednesday afternoon could be severe, the high 78. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 71 degrees in Tuscaloosa. The flagship station for Alabama Crimson Tide football. Alabama touchdown. Only on Tide 100.9 and streaming on the Tide 100.9 app. Mr. Sly Stone, Sly and the Family Stone, to be exact, right there for you. That'll get you going on a Monday. A little Sly and the Family Stone. Sly Stone, 78 years old today. So there you go. Hey, speaking of birthdays and retirements and anniversaries, Drew Brees finally made it official over the weekend. Drew Brees, after a hell of a stint there in New Orleans, decade and a half, Announces his retirement. It was expected. And Alabama fans should still send $10 a month. Need to send $10 a month or at least like a Chick-fil-A gift card for 10 bucks to that uh, Miami Dolphins team doctor who failed Drew's Dolphins physical all those years ago when he was the choice of Nick Saban behind center down there in South Florida. Wow. How good did that work out for Alabama? Nick still gets heated talking about it. He was on a podcast here recently, I think with Patrick Peterson and uh, former LSU corner. And, and they got into it. You could tell Nick still doesn't like to talk about it. Great for Alabama, though. Drew Brees and Alma would not have been a good thing for the university of Alabama. 205-342-9904. That is the Peter Rook Chocolatier Studio Line. Also, did you see today where the ACC has done away with its intra-conference transfer rule in which you were pretty much going to have to sit out a year as an intra-conference uh, transfer. And that sort of speaks to, you would think, What's expected to come here in the next month or so from the NCAA level, which is the one-time transfer rule, at least for 21-22. And so if that goes into effect, then it becomes sort of a conference issue where players, student athletes, jumping from one SCC or ACC or conference member institution to another is concerned. What the ACC essentially did today was say, look, if this one-time transfer rule goes into effect at the NCAA level, we're not going to have anything to prevent conference members, conference student athletes from going from one situation to another within our league. So now we turn to the SEC. What's up? What's up over in Birmingham? Where you at, Greg Sankey? SEC going to do away with its interconference transfer rule? Henry Toa Toa has got a keen interest in that, doesn't he? The Tennessee inside linebacker, very much on record, at least his father is, with Hank South of BamaOnline.com last month talking about 
they're essentially waiting to see what's going to happen with the one-time transfer rule. And then in relation to that, the SEC intra-conference transfer rule. And if those things go the way the Toa Toas would like, and that interview with Mr. Toa Toa anyway, seemed all but certain that Henry Toa Toa, if cleared, would all but likely be headed to the University of Alabama. So there's certainly some uh, some Alabama and Henry Toa Toa interest in what happens next with the Southeastern Conference in that regard. 205-342-9904 is the Peter Brook Chocolatier studio line. We talked a little bit earlier about Justin Thomas winning the Players' Championship. I thought it was interesting because as a lad growing up down there in Northeast Florida, I was actually – I don't know if I was at the final round. I wasn't there when Jerry Pate, if you're old enough to remember, Jerry Pate won the first, it was called the TPC, the Tournament Players Championship back then. Now it's just called the Players. But back then they switched courses. They moved across the street. They were at Sawgrass Country Club, which is right on the Atlantic Ocean there, pretty much. And they moved across A1A, to the new at the time in 1982 crazy to think that 40 plus year 40 years almost that the players or the tpc has been at the stadium course it's that old but the event moved across the street to the the stadium course and uh jerry pate won that inaugural uh, event there at, at the at the stadium course and then uh proceeded to take a plunge uh into the the pond there and I think it was Dean Beeman, the commissioner of the PGA Tour at the time, may, maybe even die, the course designer, that all went in the lake after Pate won that event. So, you know, we're talking about right at 40 years ago that happened. 40 years later, here's Justin Thomas, also a former University of Alabama golfer, getting it done, coming from behind, had the right guy out in front to make that comeback. Lee Westwood doesn't have a history of running away and hiding in final rounds in which he has the lead or is right there in contention. But you go 64-68 on the weekend like JT did, you're going to win a lot of golf tournaments. And if you shoot 12 under on the weekend on that golf course, you're going to make up a lot of ground very quickly. It's amazing, really, because – You know, JT's opening nine on Thursday, shot 38, two over. Got that thing back to where he needed it on the, he played the front nine for his back on Thursday. Really got it going there. You know, a solid round on Friday, nothing crazy, but then the weekend just went nuts. So Justin Thomas is your 2021 players champion. Now look. If we use it in sort of football terms, what the players' championship is is sort of like it's sort of like the SEC championship game in football, and then the next month the college football playoff cranks up. That's what golf basically does with the players. You've got the equivalent of the SEC championship game with the players, huge tournament, very prestigious, big price tag. Yeah, as we talked about at the top of the show, two point seven million to win that tournament for Justin. And then you get into the Masters, and the PGA has been moved up, and the U.S. Open, and then the British Open. You get into the real playoff coming up, kind of like the NCAA tournament. And why the NCAA tournament is so difficult to win, because once again, when you get to the second game, anything, anything can happen. As a one seed, a two seed, doesn't matter. So we'll see how that plays out in that hopeful We're hopeful it's a five-game stretch after that first round for the Alabama Crimson side. 205-342-9904. Man, Jacob, we're already seeing seeing the the NFL transactions are already popping, huh? Some deals getting done there in the National Football League. Yeah, it must be nice for some of these teams to hold on to their talent. (laughs) Oh, Tom Brady did it again. Restructured that deal down in Tampa, and now they're able to keep Shaq Barrett, one of their top pass rushers, able to get him on the hometown discount. Do you see that? Shaq Barrett, I think it's four years, $36 million. 
uh, or more than that, it's 36 million guaranteed, I think, for Shaq Barrett. It's, so, it's uh, 72, 72, 72 yeah, million dollars overall. 72 and 30 and half of it, I guess, guaranteed. Tom just keeps working that cat magic, man. Just all about the rings for Tom. Must be nice to have a quarterback that doesn't, you know, completely blow out his contract. And also a quarterback who has a globally famous wife who, in terms of modeling, probably makes a good bit more than even Tom, you know? See, I've always old, wondered on the, that, though. How much does that really play into it when you're you – know, I can't fathom the amount of money that any of these players make, but, you know – at the end of the day, like we all know that this is why Tom is successful is because he doesn't take max contracts at his position. Uh, mm-hmm. He's very conservative on it, but we'll, we'll probably never know whether that had to do more with Giselle or him having the wherewithal to help his team. Or yeah, I think Giselle, Giselle might have had Tom sign the prenup. You know what I mean? That one <laughs> might have worked in reverse. That one might have worked in reverse with Tom. And just sell. Hey, let's go to the Peterbrook Taco Tier Studio Line. We have Roland waiting on us on a Monday. Roland, how are you doing? Great. How are you doing, Travis? Great, sir. Uh, I missed part of the show. I caught the very beginning of it when you were talking basketball about Alabama and leadership from uh, uh, from uh, uh, the seniors on this team, uh, mm-hmm. especially on Jones. Did you see him when he they came across? Uh, toward the end of the game, and uh, Reese was joined with Watford, and he grabbed his jersey and pulled him, I mean stretched his jersey out and pulled him and shoved Reese into his part, spot talking like, it looked like he was saying, get over there on defense, quick join. <laughs> no, I mean, Herb is the consummate team leader. I, know, I mean, I love when, I, when I think of Herb, got- you know, I think of some of the like great Duke teams that Kay's had. Kay all, you know, Kay's always had talented teams, but he's always had a guy like Herb, whether it's a Shane Battier or you know what I'm saying, a guy like that yeah. that sort of holds it all together. Herb Jones is the perfect player for any team, but Herb Jones is exactly what a Kay or a Cal or coaches like that this season would have loved oh. to have had. And they don't have. And with that, they're oh, oh, yeah. watching from home. So, yeah, I mean, his value is so beyond just his stat- statistical contributions. And and they're and those are great. I mean, they're they're super. Um, but no yeah. doubt, man, that that, that guy is a, an absolute but, leader in every sense of the word. When he grabbed him and just got him in his yeah. position, I thought, man, man, you're in charge of this thing. <laughs> He runs that right, show. There's no doubt about for it. You, man. Hey, Roland, thanks for the call. Have a great rest of your Monday, my friend. All right. There he goes. Thank you, Roland. Roland was rolling on a Monday. Yeah, I mean, Herb Jones is a coach's dream, man. Kay hadn't had a guy like Herb in a long time. The, the good thing about some of those, one of the great things about those past Duke teams, they always had a guy that, that held it together like that. That just weren't, it just wasn't talent. Again, Battier was one of those guys uh, in the past. Grant Hill, for all his talent, especially later in his career, he basically did with the 94 Duke team, just getting them to the final against Arkansas. That wasn't one of Kay's most talented teams, but you got Grant Hill and he's versatile and can play defense and play on the ball. And essentially do all the things that Herb's asked to do. Better shooter, Grant Hill was, than Herb. But athletic, and on top of all that, had every intangible you could ever ask for. And that 94 Duke team, again, that that wasn't an exceptionally talented team. But when you've got, as we've heard Nick Saban talk about in football, when your best players are also your best people, that makes for a heck of a, a heck of a, an opportunity for a team to really max out its potential. That's going to do it for a Monday edition of Southern Fried Sports. Thanks to Hank South. Thanks to Roland for checking in. Thanks to Jacob Harrison for producing the show. The lunch whistle today, Southern Ale House, 1530 McFarland Boulevard North in the Indian Hill section of Tuscaloosa. Get by there for a lunch on a cloudy, dreary day. That Yardbird chicken sandwich make you feel a whole lot better. Trust me. Southern Ale House, 1530 McFarland Boulevard North in the Indian Hills section of Tuscaloosa. Until 11 a.m. on Tuesday, have a great rest of your Monday, everybody.